This year, the UK is hosting the 26th UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, in Glasgow. The summit brings parties together to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We're joined by Stephen Mearsman, founder director of Zenobi Energy, one of the companies that are showcasing their innovative technology in Glasgow, and they've kindly shipped in this impressive looking bit of kit for us to look at today. Stephen, welcome to Fully Charged Plus. Can you tell us a bit more about Zenobi and what you're doing at COP26? Sure. Um, Zenobi, we provide turnkey solutions for the electrification of buses and other fleets, as well as use grid scale storage to make our energy grid greener. Uh, so the three big themes at COP that we're obviously very excited about because they really fit with our business model, that's energy, finance and transport because we're really bringing those networks together uh, with the use of software and equipment such as this here. I mean this is a really impressive piece of kit, can you tell me more about how it works? Well, this is one of the high powered DC chargers that we use to charge more than 600 electric buses uh, at the moment. It's part of a, a system that obviously involves things you can't see like the software that makes sure the buses are charged on time but at the same time also don't blow through the grid connection or create outages etc etc and minimize the cost. We're really using all this to take the hassle out of electrification for the operators by being there from the moment it's a twinkle in their eye all the way through operation, installing equipment like this, keeping it up and running and, and making sure they've got an excellent service at the lowest possible cost that's also the most ecologically sustainable. This is the tip of the iceberg, the bit we see, but I imagine there's a lot below the surface. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the software piece is not just controlling these chargers, it's the same software we use to manage 100 megawatt bat uh, grid connected batteries as well as single chargers like this, as well as a software system that talks to the bus while it's out on the road. So we've got a full turnkey 24 7 vision of exactly what's happening to the batteries, the chargers, everything on the infrastructure, which is really what allows us to optimize and uh, reduce cost for our customers. So your, your plan is to lower all the barriers and make it as easy as possible for your customers to go on this journey? Th that's correct. Take out the hassle factor and take out the risk because there's so many different stakeholders that need to come together in an electrification project. That's like buy a Tesla, charge it at home, done. No, you've got um, a grid, uh, gr grid connection provider, you've got the utility, you've got uh, engineers, you've got various departments within the operator, operations, the people who park it, facilities, etc. And if something goes wrong, everyone does this. So we're really taking, the, we're really the glue in pulling all that together for them. And how many customers have you been through this process with and what was their response to it? We've got about, um, by the end of the year, we have about 24 depots live uh, across the UK, uh, New Zealand and Australia. Feedback so far has been uniformly positive. Obviously, with any transition, there's always some teething issues those first few weeks in, in, in various things and we always learn something new. But at the same time, they're super excited about the transition. The drivers about how clean and quiet the buses are, the finance department about how they're much cheaper to run than they expected even, um, and, uh, and the engineers because they don't break down as much. And presumably the passengers as well. Well, obviously we shouldn't forget about the passengers, that's a very fair point. They're excited because, well, as I said, it's quieter, so suddenly you can have a conversation again on the bus. Vibrations and noise are, other than air quality, really not so good things for you. So being on an electric bus that takes all those things away as well is, is, is yeah, it's great for the passenger. And if we can lower operating costs by having people not transition in 10 years to electric but doing it today, eventually we hope that that will reflect itself in the fares as well. Passenger vehicles are important, of course, but fleets even more so. Tell us more about why. Because the fleets do the most miles. It's, a, it's as simple as that. And uh, they're also large vehicles carrying lots of people or lots of goods. So starting there uh, has the biggest impact first. Secondly, uh, because there's a few large fleet oper operators, say there's about 20 large bus operators in in UK, many regional ones, same with uh, Amazon, DPD, etc. It's quite concentrated. So by influencing a few key players, you can get a lot more done in a short amount of time, which is one of the reasons we see fleet electrification as one of the quickest ways to get to net zero. When you mentioned net zero, we shouldn't forget the environmental benefits and potential damage that new technologies can do. Now we understand batteries and how green they are, but I think it would be useful if you explain how green you can make this process. I think there's two bits of that. Obviously it's, well, what's the energy that's going into this charger, into the vehicles? We, we try to make sure that's as green as, as possible by working with our suppliers. Later this year we're going to go one step further and start sourcing power directly from solar and wind farms, community schemes in the local area, so the power is not only green but also local. 
the other bit is, well, this is one big piece of kit. The one thing that was a bit harder to bring here was uh, the 40 foot container that might be sitting in a depot as the battery storage, avoiding the expensive and time consuming grid upgrade. Well, that can help make the sun shine at night almost because the great big roofs that a lot of these companies have can then be used to generate solar power, store part of that in the battery and then use it to charge the vehicles at night, which is again a cost saving and an ecological benefit. And sometimes do you generate renewable energy on site as well? Yes, uh, as I said, we start to use the rooftops. Uh, in some cases, one of our customers got a, a wind turbine as well okay. that we then try to repurpose. The second part of that question is actually what happens with the batteries when they come off the vehicle. And it's really there that you can make it greener as well by making sure you give that battery as long a life as possible or multiple lives. So on a bus, it needs to run 200 miles. It'll degrade at some point and not be able to do that anymore. So you need to replace it. Rather than recycle, we'll take that battery out and use it in our stationary projects. That could be the 100 megawatts we're building the Merseyside for National Grid. Or again, going in a bus depot like in Coventry, where we're putting a second life uh, battery to power um, a bus depot. So that's really coming full circle there. So there's no rush necessary to move to recycling straight away. There's lots of different things you can do with yeah, the battery so after its initial purpose. Sometimes kicking the can down the road can be a good thing in this case, <laughs> because we're getting well extra mileage out of that system by going from the really heavy applications, EV, to slightly more gentle applications, grid stabilization, so we can have more renewables on our grid. Then later on to say backup power in an industrial estate and you sort of can keep stretching it. Then effectively that means you need less raw materials in circulation, which then means less mining, which then means this whole transition becomes cheaper. Now I'm really interested in all those uh, end of life applications that you describe, but there's some other end of life things which are quite interesting as well yeah, that you do. Obviously we're very excited about buses but people sometimes get more excited about slightly faster cars and more rugged environments. So obviously the project we did with Xtreme E is a, is, a, is a great example where we took old bus batteries from Sweden that had been on a bus for four or five years, put it in a portable skid that then actually can replace uh, generation or, or other types of, of mobile power that's often used. So we powered a television broadcast at Extreme E in uh, Senegal, obviously withstanding the extreme heat of the Sahara. And then after that, we went straight to Greenland to deal with extreme cold and salty seawater. So it's showing that batteries can be used in these extreme applications really breaks open the market because it takes a lot of fear away. Because you can say, well, putting a battery here in London to power this film set. Yes, it can do that because we did it in, uh, in the Sahara. It's a, it's a good, good people, way to calm down people. People often confuse batteries from mobile phones with these kind of bigger batteries and what they can do in extreme conditions. But tell me a bit more about the kind of the heat and cold that you went through in Senegal and, and Greenland with Extreme E. Yeah, one of the big important things is that battery technology has come a long way with the hardware, the chemistry, etc. But another big piece that's really been driving things is the data we get off that and the software. So by putting things in these extreme applications where it's incredibly hot, so obviously, well, how hard can you push the cooling? Um, when you monitor it, can you sweat the asset a bit more or can you slightly reduce the output you give it and still have the desired uh, end effect on, on the customer side. So it's all these things that really get tested in these extreme applications and we like doing firsts and so did Extreme E. So from that perspective, it was a great collaboration to really try and see, well, can we continue to push the envelope and, and show that battery power can make clean power more accessible in all sorts of applications, be it buses, vans, um, portable power at film sets or construction sites and, and, and many other things to come. Okay, so by, I don't know, 2025, for example, I mean, what actual impact is this going to make from a carbon perspective? Can you talk about that? It's going to be quite large. Hard to visualise, but yeah. nevertheless huge and important. And in our cities, which is the other bit. It's like in our most populated centres, we're taking pollution away, where again, it has the biggest impact. So Zenobi's got huge momentum now after, I think, just five years in, in operation. Uh, and I think it's only going to get faster for you. But where do you hope to go with the business in the next five to ten years? Yeah, well, one of the big focuses for us, obviously, over the next few months is, um, is getting all those depots live. If I can briefly focus on the, on the tactical, then COP26 really is a milestone for us. Because, again, the three themes that are important to us, energy, transport and finance and, and, and seeing what's happening in that space wider in the world. And then building on, on, the, on the momentum. So we've, we've currently provi providing power or, or, or our services about one in three electric buses in the UK. We want to see more buses, maintain that market share if we can, but also taking the lessons from here and applying it in different markets. We've got our first projects going live in Australia and New Zealand. We're then also expanding into the Benelux as a beachhead into Europe. 
that's geographic expansion. But the other piece is it, it, taking the learnings from bus and then expanding into slightly harder applications like last mile deliveries, where the routes are a lot less predictable. So if we can keep doing that, I think we've got exciting things to do over the next five years. I mean, we've set ourselves a milestone of 3,000 buses and one gigawatt of uh, large grid scale storage. So at the current rate, yeah, we might do it a bit quicker than 2025. So you're on a fantastic journey. I think Zenobi's got a very bright future ahead. How do people follow your, your progress? Well, um, obviously, um, we've got our website and our social media on, on LinkedIn and Twitter, and there's a lot of activity that we're doing in the run-up to COP, so that's, that's, I would recommend that as a place to start. Uh, thanks, Stephen. It's great to talk to you. Um, this is a, a huge uh, step forward. Uh, your technology is fantastic. We look forward to following you uh, more closely on Fully Charged. Well, that's it for this episode on Fully Charged Plus. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to the channel. And if you have been, thanks for watching. <laughs>